Okay, Joe Ryan, it's great to see you. Um, and thank you so much for joining me to ask a few questions about your um, your coaching uh, and how you've evolved as a coach. Um, how are things with you in Mullingar? Yeah, all it's good, Bashir. Thanks for having me on here. and um, delighted to be, to be part of the series. Um, yeah, look, coaching is is a little different at the moment it's, it's going well a lot of the group are, are training well and going well and um, looking forward to getting back into um into competition in, in 2021 um but look we, it's it's been challenging it's been different over the past year but um i think most athletes have, have made the most of it taking the opportunity to to work under on, on some weaknesses and um emerge from all this as better athletes when competition resumes again and hopefully yes uh that, that, that's going to come much sooner uh, rather than later, but with the vaccination uh, uh, rolling out, hopefully um, things will return sooner rather than later. Okay. Yeah, I think it'll be a few months we get back to normal, hopefully. For sure, for sure. Um, and I, I think you were saying that, you know, um, the fact that there's been so little racing and um, some of the athletes have moved on comfortably well and not been distracted by too many races. Yeah, I think some of it's... I suppose in a normal season, it's quite easy to get distracted by short term and immediate targets, whereas for a lot of the, the last year, it's been apparent that there would be no competition. So it gave athletes the opportunity to um, to focus on areas of weakness for them, to focus on areas that they needed to develop. And I suppose to take a more long term and holistic approach to the sport and think how can they what can they do over the weeks and months to, to emerge from it as better athletes? And I think those who have been lucky enough to remain consistent um, have, have developed um, and some quite significantly. Um, so look, now it's all about getting back on the track and, um, and trying to prove that and to show that they've moved on and developed in 2021. But every cloud has a silver lining, and I suppose for some, it brought that opportunity to, to focus on, on a more um, long-term approach, which as, as coaches and athletes, we look to do anyway, but it's in some ways it can be easier to do it without a, a bunch of competitions in the, in the short term. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think you're right. I think we know that uh, a lot of a lot of athletes reach the peak kind of uh, after the age of twenty four. So they've got to be in it for the long, the long haul to get the best out of themselves. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, and as a coach, what what would you say are the uh, main coaching processes that you focus on? Uh, maybe you know two or three key areas that you focus on with your coaching. Yeah. I suppose here, two or three coaching processes. One really is the long-term development of athletes and, and transfer from, from junior into under 23 into senior. And um, that would be one, one area. Um, another one that I'll speak about briefly is periodization and then also athlete pro profiling. And some of those things are, you know, there's other things that merge into those as well. But um, I was looking at long-term athlete, long-term planning and, and um, you know, going through the ages, going from from youth to junior into under twenty three into senior, and um, that is something that we, as we just spoke about there a moment ago, um, just taking that long term approach is, is required, and um, training at a, an optimum level to enable an athlete to improve, but also not training so hard that it jeopardizes future improvement in the years ahead. Because as you said, you know, it's it's you're looking to. But, um, a structure in place that allows athletes to be in the sport for a long time and to emerge as, as senior athletes. Um, I suppose in my group, I, I have a, a number of different athletes at various stages along that continuum. Um, I have some like Amy O'Donoghue, who's national senior 1500 meter champion, who's an established senior and is looking to push on. I have others like John Fitzsimons, who um, was a good youth, took a European junior medal, was a European under 23 finalist, and is now, when we get back to racing, looking to establish himself as, as a senior international athlete as well. And I have others then like, like Keen McPhillips, who just over the past few years has been moving through the youth and junior ranks. Um, and he, he won the Millrose Mile last year at the, um, the high school mile at the Millrose Games. So it's, it's nice as well for me as a coach to have athletes at various stages on it. And I think there's a, a lot of learnings um, that I can implement from looking at how the other athletes uh, have, have done that over the past number of years, what went well for them, what pitfalls to to avoid as uh, during that process but um so i think that is, is one key area i think then in, in terms of planning a, a season periodization just to move on to the second one there and um, really there for me that's about establishing a, a goal or a, a number of, of goals for a particular season and putting a plan in place to ensure that the athletes are 
um, in a position to to deliver the performances in, in the key races, whether they're just target races to run fast or whether it's a championship that they're aiming towards. Um, and I think, I suppose, I suppose, assuming then that, you know, you're looking to, to have a good aerobic base in place that um, you know, that general preparation phase has gone well, that then allows you to, to move through the, the specific phases and then to start sharpening as competition approaches and, and get into peak shape. Um, I, I do think as well, there needs to be a degree of flexibility in that not all plans always go seamlessly. And I, I, I particularly, I suppose, in COVID times, um, even last April, May, I remember chatting to Amy O'Donoghue and we weren't even sure that she would run on the track last summer and yet she ended up winning the National Senior 1500 metres. So I think there needs to be a degree of flexibility in your approach as well, but a good solid um, plan and, and periodised plan is required to get the best out of an athlete over, a se over the course of a season. Um, I think then really athlete profiling. Um, but a lot of the athletes that I coach are in that 800 meter, 1500 meter space as well. And that's an area I do really enjoy coaching. Um, but 800 meters particularly is an event where you can come at it from a number of sides. There are people who are, you know, 400, 800 meter background. There are maybe 800 meter specialists and there are others that are, you know, coming at it maybe from the 1500 meter side. So there's quite a lot of, um, of ways to approach it. There's a lot of differences in training there. Um, you know, for, for even athletes who are, who are focused on the same event. And I think it's important to, um, to identify early what, that, what the athlete profile is. And there's a number of ways, I suppose, of doing that. Some of the times it's pretty obvious, you know, based on the, the top end speed that athletes will have sometimes in a lab test, that those things will become apparent um, when you actually, you know, take lactates or see what, what they are in a, in a physiological test. Um, so I think applying that then really, once you, you're aware of what, the profile of an athlete is just actually tailoring the training to meet the, meet the needs of um, the specific athlete is is um, is the job of work then for the coach at that point. Um, and look, it's nice to have a, a balance of, of that. And I know like within my own group as well, like for 800 metres, for example, you know, Claire Mooney and John Fitzsimons will be two athletes who've come from a 400 metre background. Um, Kean can run a very quick 800 metres, but probably approaching it from the 1500 metre side. And then I have others like like Mark Milner, who are, would be probably 800 meter specialists. So there is that side. Also, then for athletes who are slightly focused on longer distances, um, you know, your 5K, 10K cross country athlete, it's just identifying that because they won't really respond to, very well to a lot of high intensity um, top end speed work. So you're looking at identifying what their profile is um, and you know, putting a plan in place to, to suit their strengths. And I suppose for me and my group there, I have guys like Jamie Battle, who's been to a number of junior championships and, and Cormac Dalton. So it, it's nice to have a, a group of guys in each different category, I suppose, there of, of endurance running. Um, you know, as, as you become more experienced as a coach, it probably gets a little easier to, to profile them and to um, ensure that the training is, is correct for them. And it's certainly... Uh, you know, a, an enjoyable part of the of the process for me. I think as well, you know, just coupled with with that, um, you know, I think in order to the process of coaching, I think as athletes get older, it is important to have strong lines of communication with them. And that's vitally important for an athlete to progress. Um, it's important that the coach listens to the athlete and also I suppose that there's you know good communication and when the coach has a point of view that the athletes take that on board as well. Many of the athletes that I coach I've coached for several years so I think we've established quite strong lines of communication and there's a lot of open and honest discussion there which which definitely makes it easier I, I think from, from both sides. And then I suppose another part of the, the coaching process for me really is, is reflection on what I've done as a coach, what the athletes have done themselves, um, you know, over, the, over a period of days, weeks, months, and at the end of a season. And to just take the time to sit down and analyse, you know, what went well, what could have been a little better, and to be open-minded, I suppose, enough to appreciate that, you know, not everything is always perfect in a season. And usually, you know, with the benefit of hindsight anyway, there are things that you would improve. So it's just to keep um, that in mind and to, to bear that in, in mind as you go along as a coach. Great. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a fairly comprehensive answer. Um, one other thing that I, I was going to ask on the processes of the coaching, is obviously you, you're involved with DCU now. Um, so, so you're working out of there. And, and then there are um, 
the athletes in the USA on scholarships, because I, I know you, you, you've worked with Jack O'Leary, who's doing quite well at the moment. Um, do you communicate much with the coaches over there uh, in the USA? And um, um, how does the coaching process work You know, with these athletes that go to America? Yeah, I suppose in, in GCU, first of all, I've just um, started there in the past year. Paul Byrne is the um, head of athletics there, and he, he brings a lot of knowledge and enthusiasm to it there. And he's already putting great structures in place in DCU. Um, at the moment, we've, you know, he has just started some online SNC, which obviously isn't ideal. We'd rather be in the, the gym doing it, but it's the best that we can have at the moment. So it's, he's quite innovative in terms of putting a structure and a system in place. And I think it, it's an exciting time for DCU. It's a place, it's a, a university in Ireland with, with a great history. Um, and a great tradition in athletics and I think with Paul there and he's put a team of coaches in in all event groups I think it'll be you know a lot more to come from DCU in the future as well I think they will build on that tradition that's there and continue to have success yeah Jack O'Leary has been in the States for the past um, he's on his fifth year there at the moment Jack has ran 7.53 for 3k last year and 13.44 for 5k he's been at the top of the Irish rankings um, in both those events in for the indoor season of 2020 um so he has got he was in iona and um i had an athlete there before in iona that i coached jake Byrne. so joe pienta is the head coach there i would have strong lines of communication with joe um and uh so i, I think for athletes who, who go to the states look there is an appreciation when they go to the states they need to buy into the program that's over there um and not be trying to do you know some of what they used to do at home potentially if it's different i think if you do take up a scholarship with a u.s university then you probably do need to do, actually there's no probably about it you do need to buy into it and, and adapt to the program there but i think some of the, the coaches there it varies i suppose from 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 college to college but um some would have a uh, strong lines of communication there with other um with, with other um with with the coaches back home lovely um as a coach thinking about uh, your development because we never stop learning do we and um, what what uh what areas are you working on to improve as a coach presently yeah i'm coaching for 17 or 18 years now um but I think you're you're right. You you never stop learning. There's always um something, you know, new to to develop and to take into consideration. So for me, I suppose personally, I'm I'm currently doing the level three with Athletics Ireland that has kicked off in the past couple of months again. Like most things these days, um, the first few sessions of it have been on Zoom. But it, it look it's great to get the course started again, and I'm enjoying that so far. So I'm looking forward to some some learnings from that as the course progresses. Um, I think. There's a lot of information available out there at the moment through, um, you know, you, that a coach can do, can research independently articles and journals about the sport. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of information available on, online as well about, you know, what other athletes, other groups around the world are doing. Um, and you can see, you know, what is applicable to your group from what, what others are doing as well. I think it is important not to just see workouts and sessions and just try and copy them because everything is in a context of a training plan um, and you know feeding into your your training year so um, but there's a lot of information out there that athletes can produce can, can and coaches can access and that can help um, guide and, and steer their training there as well I think as well looking at the decisions that athletes have made over over time to enable them to get to the top is a, a good um you know, it's a good learning for, for coaches and athletes as well. And I think, you know, we don't have to look any further than our own country there to look at, you know, the likes of Kira McGee and Thomas Barr, Mark English, who've all medaled at European Championships over the past um, 10 years. So when you look at the choices and the decisions that they've made to to reach that level, you know, there's there's learning there for, for athletes and, and coaches. Um, yeah, as I, I spoke on earlier, like, you know, actually taking the time to, to discuss, you know, and to reflect on um, how... A micro cycle, a, a season, whatever it may be, has went with an athlete or even independently as a coach is also helpful to um, to develop as a coach. So I think they are probably the key areas that I would be focusing on at the moment. Lovely. And um, in in terms of your support crew, the uh, the people around uh, Joe Ryan at Mullingar at DCU, and you've mentioned um, Paul Byrne already that, that he's he's supporting certainly the the coaching structure at DCU. 
Um, who are the, what are the people that are supporting you with your coaching? Yeah, I suppose for me, last year, that's wide and varied, really, in the sense, I suppose we, we treat them independently first. There's a few different um, lines along here. As, you know, some athletes like, like Keen, Mike Phillips, and John Fitzsimons would be carded. Um, so they would be, they would have access to the institute and um, they would work with people like uh, Martina McCarthy for SNC and Kira McCallion for um, physio. So for, but for those who are then in different colleges, they would tap into the, the college that they're, they're with. I'm obviously coaching in, in DCU and um, Paul Byrne is the head of athletics there, as we said, and um, Paul is putting structures in place, you know, to, as best we can at the moment and looking forward to getting back to more normality and more face-to-face -face time with athletes. So it's an exciting time for DCU as well. Um, he has Claire Brady on board um, to deliver that SNC at the moment. So that's looking really, really good. Um, Mullingar Harriers, yeah, look, over the, I spent a lot of time coaching at Mullingar over the past 15 years. Um, and at the moment I do coach, obviously, the athletes there, some of the athletes there like Cormac Dalton, Jamie Battle, um, and some of the older juveniles as well. But in Mullingar now, we have a really good team of coaches. Um, there's probably 15 to 20 coaches who have completed, um, you know, Athletics Ireland certification. So that the, the club, as a club, we're in a really, really strong position. I suppose if we just focus on the middle distance coaching from, from um, juveniles, because if I try and cover everybody, I'll certainly leave a few people out. So I won't even try that. But if I look at the, you know, the, the coaches who are, working with, with me um, at the juvenile, at juvenile level for middle distance. Um, they're really the guys who would be on the ground. I would be involved in the planning side of things and would observe, observe some sessions. But the people who are there week in, week out would be um, Mandy Dalton, who's Cormac Dalton's um, mother. Um, she invests a huge amount of time in, in the coaching of the juvenile athletes. Alan Sherwin is a former athlete himself and his son Connor is one of our leading juveniles at the moment. And um, Tom Wallace is another coach who's very actively involved. His daughter, Amy, actually won the junior schools um, 800 metres when they were last held. So there's a really strong group of, of coaches there. And um, we have a really strong group of athletes coming through in the club as well, which is great to see. So I, I think, you know, we have a strong tradition at the club and the future is bright there as well. Um, and some of those young athletes would be people who over the past year have been quite committed and kept running and we can really see the development that that, um, that they have made over that time. It's probably a little bit more difficult for the young athletes to see that because they haven't had the opportunity to race and to put that on the board. But I think as coaches, we can certainly see the improvement that they've made. And I think when we do get back to a more normal season, hopefully we'll, we'll see the evidence of that on the, on the track and over the cross country as well. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much the, as I said, then the other athletes that... Um, so, that are in various other colleges in Carlow IT, like John Fitzsimons is there, he would tap into the resources that are available there. Um, and uh, others then like Mark Milner and Rose Finnegan are at UCD. So the nature of the group is that we have a few in different locations around the country. Um, and sometimes it, it usually makes sense that you know, there is a, a support team locally available to them as well, rather than trying to have, to have a centralized one. A lot of the guys that I coach who are based around Dublin, would go to Colin Griffin as well for SNC, and a lot of them, and even some would travel from outside of Dublin to um, Deck Monaghan to attend him as a physio. And um, Deck has been away on international trips with me in the past, so I know him quite well as well, which is is good to have that link um, in there as well. So overall, I suppose look, it's it's wide and varied, but I think for our, for the athletes, we have a a good solid um, support team in place for each one of them. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a, a massive number of people to communicate with, and uh, goodness knows, uh, you, you, you are a busy man without a shadow of a doubt. Um, in, in terms of tapering for events, um, you know, tapering for a big competition um, and peaking, um, what, what are perhaps three things that you'd uh, focus on coming up to a, a competition? Okay, I suppose for, for peaking and, and tapering, for a competition, there's a number of um, things that we would take into cons consideration. Generally, athletes like to reduce the volume um, that they do the week of a race or 10 days leading into a race. Um, for many, particularly the shorter distance guys, they would um, reduce that by up to 30, 35%. Um, others like to reduce it, typically the, the more endurance guys, like you know, in my own group, like Cormac and Jamie would probably, they like to keep the mileage a little higher in the week of a race or they sometimes feel a little flat. 
you know, whereas younger athletes potentially like like Keen before his middle rose mile, he would have had a very, very easy week and still race extremely well coming into it fresh. So I think I suppose to some degree it's about finding an individual approach and a, a balance that works for the athlete. Um, but having said that, there are, I think uh, there's a lot of common ground there for in that tapering process. Generally, I'd like the last key workout or the final preparation race for a target race to be seven to 10 days before the, the key event. Um, following that would be, as I said, a potential reduction in volume um, as it comes in and just look to stay sharp with some strides and a small bit of, small bit of um, short reps at base pace um, five to six days out from the, four to five days out from the competition. But again, you're not looking to generate huge amounts of lactate at that process so generous recoveries and uh, just a, a, short, a small volume of short distance reps at race pace i think that's you know in the final few days before a race as well a lot of it is i think really is about your your mental preparation i mean some guys like to to rest the day before others like to rest two days out um, and i think it's about finding the balance that works for the athletes so that when they get on the line they're in that the best possible frame of mind that that they can be um, I think it is nice that, that that final key session or that final race needs to be a, a positive one to send the athlete away knowing that they're, they're feeling ready um, for it. And I suppose from my own group, one example that kind of comes to mind there is like the in John Fitzsimons four years ago won a European medal um, in the 800 metres bronze in the European under 2800. And his final race prior to that was the national, um, one, was the national junior 800 metres. Um, and he won it in two minutes, which is an unremarkable time for a guy going to a European juniors, but he did that with a, a 70 second opening lap and a 50 second closing 400 meters. So I suppose we knew at that point that he was in, in excellent shape and although ranked 20th as a junior, when you can close in 50 seconds off any modest pace in an 800 meters, you can pretty much run with anybody. Um, so really that, that tapering process, it, it's just about finding what works for the athlete, making sure that they go in, go, are going into the race feeling fresh, healthy um, and, and ready for it. It's, uh, you know, it's it, it, there's a lot of common ground, as I said, but it is individual in, in nature as well. And it's just finding what works best for each um, individual athlete. Um, you know, that's really okay. where it goes to it. And then what about uh, as yourself? Because when you were competing um, um, and, and you, you did um, some race walking, didn't you? How, you know, how would you take yeah. up for that? Yeah, actually, I suppose similar last year to probably what a 5K or 10K runner would do as well. In the same, like, I mean, I, I race walked as a junior athlete. Um, yeah, look, it would have been similar reduction in mileage, 30 to 40% uh, in terms of a reduction in race week. Um, I suppose race walking is a little different in the sense that you're not doing that high-end work because it would be potentially damaging for your technique anyway. So it's a lot more aerobic in nature in terms of preparation. But um, yeah, that's... It's so long ago, last year, I've nearly forgotten about it. But yeah. it's uh, no, it's it, it's it's actually um, you know, it's quite similar, I suppose, to what a five k um or ten k athlete would, would do, because that was the, the distance at junior level for race walking. Yeah. And and do you, do you have any race walkers that you work with um, at uh, the various places you're at? Um, no, actually, I, I'm I'm not involved in coaching race walking at all. Um. Michael Lane is in, in Mullingar Harriers and he's um you know heavily involved in race walking. So he looks after the, the, the walkers there. Um so no, actually during my, from pretty much from the start of my coaching, it's been it's been endurance running, cross country, middle distance running. Um so I suppose I'm so immersed in that now at the moment that I'm happy to, to continue along yeah. that route. Yeah, I think I think yeah, the, the number of athletes you've got, you know, you're a credit to the sport that, that you, you're looking after so many. Um and you know, certainly at the high performance level. So, uh, yeah, but what what uh, what a job you're doing? Uh, and that brings me to, to the the final question: is is what do what does a coach do in their downtime? How do you relax? Yeah, downtime is, is quite scarce at the moment. Um, <clears throat> look, um, yeah, um, I, I'm working full time, obviously teaching. I'm married to Aoife. We have two small kids, so that takes up a, a lot of time as well. Athletics then you know, takes a, a lot of the remaining time. But like everything else, I do enjoy in, in more normal times. We like to go out for a meal, relax, watch TV and um, spend time with kids. So, yeah, it's um, it's really uh, just pretty much the, the normal stuff and trying to 
trying to find time to do it really is is the key but i'm lucky in a sense as well like my wife Aoife, is very very supportive and uh you know that enables me to to kind of do what i need to do for athletics and also i suppose we just make sure it's really about being organized and planning your time to make sure that it doesn't you know nothing actually consumes it that work has its place athletics has its place and that there is designated family time as well and um you know time that we can we can spend together and enjoy so yeah look hopefully hopefully 2021 we'll see us getting back to some of those things that we can do and enjoy again brilliant brilliant keeping balanced and uh getting the job done thank you thank you ever so much for um your time joe there's lots of quality information there that i'm sure coaches up and down the country uh, are going to draw from uh, and uh, good luck going forwards thank you very, very much brilliant Bye-bye.